We have Eric Zhu, who works on machine learning for dialogue understanding in the Google Assistant. He also serves as the machine learning for Project Eager, an effort to identify beaver dams in satellite imagery. Eric earned a bachelor's degree in computer science with a minor in machine learning from Carnegie Mellon University, where he graduated with honors. Nick Clinton is on the Google Earth Engine Developer Relations team. He received a bachelor's, master's, and PhD from the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management at UC Berkeley. Nick has worked in the Airborne, Airborne Sensor Facility of NASA Ames Research Center and has served on the faculty of the Center for Earth Science at Tsinghua University in Beijing, China. Then he then joined Google in 2015. His research in includes his research interests include machine learning on geospatial imagery, information extraction from spaceborne and airborne sensors, statistical modeling of and statistical modeling of Earth surface processes. And we also have Eddie Corwin, who is a sustainability partner for Google's offices in North and South America. Eddie supports the implementation of sustainable building strategies across a wide variety of buildings and ownership models. In addition to Google's internal programs, Eddie engages in, the, in external programs such as the California Best Buildings Challenge, the New York City Mayor's Carbon Challenge, and green building certifications. Over the past five years, Eddie has focused on corporate water stewardship, including Alliance for Water Stewardship Certification at Google's Los Angeles and Dublin campuses, and implementing Google's corporate water stewardship strategy. Hello, everyone. I'm very, very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Eddie Corwin. As was said, I have been leading our corporate water stewardship program for our global office portfolio for a couple of years now. Um, I was first introduced to beavers after reading Water, A Natural History by Alice Outwater. Uh, me and a couple of colleagues on my team read it together uh, and, you know, first found beavers and found, started to fall in love with them. We kept reading more books, and then eventually, uh, me and my colleague Dan, who's in the audience, we went to State of the Beaver in Southern Oregon, and from then on, we have been true believers. <laughs> um, <clears throat> one of the things, um, or look, actually, this, this is our, our team that we've put together. Uh, one of the things that is really fun about working at Google is there's this concept of 20% projects where, uh, you know, if you find something that you're passionate about and you care about, you should be able to spend about 20% of your time working on that. And that's actually how Gmail was created. And so, you know, being at Google, uh, really getting into water and becoming a new, newly uh, formed beaver believer, uh, I was thinking, hey, we're at Google, we've got some of the best mapping experts and some of the best machine learning experts in the world. I wonder if we could leverage this knowledge to create a tool that can automatically identify beaver dams from satellite imagery. It was just a concept at the time, but we kind of shopped it around, found some folks that were interested in working with us on this, and now I'm very excited to share what we've been able to do with you all today. So here's our team. Nick and Eric are going to present after me. We also got um, Steffi and Aman and Dan Ackerstein. And of course, the amazing Emily Fairfax has been um, really working very closely with us, providing the data uh, and a lot of true uh, expertise and insight. Uh, so at, at Google, you know, one of our taglines when we talk about sustainability is that Google is building technology that helps people do more for the planet. Uh, and a few quick examples of that that helped to inspire us to think about this particular tool. Uh, Project Sunroof. This is a tool that looks at satellite imagery and uses machine learning to automatically evaluate the solar potential of rooftops. So anybody can go in and look at your own rooftop, which is really cool. Cities can also use it to evaluate their entire city. Uh, flood forecasting, very accurate flood forecasting, again, using machine learning models to predict uh, ahead of a storm where the flooding is going to occur so that you can properly prepare for it. Uh, and Global Fishing Watch, a very cool one that uses the, uh, the pings from boats that you know, they have to use to track where they are, using that and analyzing the movements of the boats to understand what type of fishing they're doing and then where they're going. And governments can use this to help uh, manage their own regulations. So, water and Google. 
Well, as I said, I have been helping to lead our water stewardship program. And late last year, we released our public water stewardship commitment and goal. Uh, the, the strategy is threefold, that we really will focus on responsible water use in our own operations that's on our sites. Uh, we want to benefit the communities and watersheds that support our operations. And we do that by funding what we call replenish projects off of our campus, but in the watersheds that support us. These can be things like funding efficiency or leak detection at low-income housing, uh, wetland restoration, riparian corridor restoration, groundwater recharge, charge, you name it. Uh, and then also supporting water security with technology. And so this tool itself is certainly something that you all know can help support water security with technology, but also in that middle pillar in benefiting watersheds and communities where we have a goal to replenish more water than we consume by 2030. I have a hypothesis, or we all in this room know that beavers are probably one of the best ways to do that, right? Not only do they provide the volumetric benefit, but all of the co-benefits that come with it from habitat, biodiversity, water quality, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to go into that. So without further ado, I'm gonna invite Eric to come show us a little bit more about the model itself. Cool, I thought Eddie was gonna take the slide, so I'll have a stab at it. <laughs> okay, so, so um, like Eddie said, um, uh, we started this project basically with the question of whether machine learning can identify beavers. Um, so in the left picture here, you can see like a small, uh, probably 500 meter, some square image. Um, we can identify this by hand, right? Like there's four beaver dams here. Most people in this room can probably do that. But the question here is now we have a county, like how, how do we try to figure out where the beavers are? Um, so obviously you can use a tool like iBeaver and you should, um, but we were also trying to figure out at first, just as a research question, whether we could identify beavers at scale with some, something like a machine learning approach. Um, so I'll briefly talk about the eager model, um, EE standing for earth engine, which Nick will talk about later. Um, so the first thing to note is that beaver dams have a lot of variation, um, because you know, they're building wherever they are. Um, but at the same time, um, one thing that we'll note is that there's a lot of patterns that emerge, like sort of certain typologies with the ways beaver build their dam. Um, now, it's really hard to list out all the patterns, but there's enough patterns that we know that um, there is a pattern. Knowing that there's a pattern, um, in probably the past 10 years, um, people have started using um, machine learning to figure out how to tease out these types of patterns. Um, in particular, um, we're using this method called deep learning, which just uses basically like a large, very uh, roughly similar to human brain type uh, model to um, ingest and predict data. Um, with that, with deep learning in particular, data becomes very, very important. Like uh, compared with previous machine learning methods from 20 years ago, deep learning requires orders of magnitude more data. Um, because of that, um, we basically reached out probably a year ago um, to folks in the beaver community to help provide some data. Um, so the first thing we wanna say is thank you so much. That's the only reason this project exists. Um, thank you, Wally, Joe, Mike, and uh, Emily Fairfax, who um, is our sort of primary partner on this. Um, we have currently approximately 10,000 or so positive data points, um, mostly in Idaho and Colorado, um, where the, re uh, the research is done. Um, and our model sort of is trying to generalize out of those areas into other areas. Um, and so I'll quickly talk about, uh, I don't have too much time, I'll quickly talk about what we're doing with data points. So when we come in, all we get is a lat long for each beaver uh, positive point, um, and the data was collected. The date is just so that we can match it with satellite imagery from when it was collected. We generate a bunch of random points, usually for each point we generate around four negative points, um, just so that the model can see what is not a beaver dam, which is very important. We sample within valleys in particular because um, that's sort of like, we want to figure out uh, places that are in valleys that um, have no beaver. Um, then we collect a bunch of satellite imagery data for each point. Um, 
we use Google internal imagery, which is at 0.2 meter resolution, which is quite high res. Um, we also use um, DEMs to generate slope data, also at 0 0.2 uh, meter resolution, because um, Beaver typically build their dams in certain slope typologies. Um, uh, to note, we have not used things like near infrared yet because we don't have high resolution enough imagery for that. Um, but it's a project in project in progress. Sorry. Um, so I'll briefly talk about our model. Um, it's a form of a convolutional neural network. What that means is basically it runs these things on the left called convolutions, and they basically just scan over an image, um, apply some weights to it, and then you stack these convolutions like this. Um, I believe our model has something like 10 million parameters, and they're all learned in the course of around an hour of training. So you just keep feeding the model your data points over and over again until it uh, gets better accuracy. Um, and so what you're waiting for, the results. Um, so we're just going to briefly talk about the results here. So this is the area that Emily earlier mentioned as Damageddon. Um, I think she said there are, are 100 plus dams in this area, which is wild. Um, Emily uh, graciously <laughs> labeled all of them for us um, in white here. I don't know how long it took her. <laughs> um, then here, she also graciously labeled all beaver habitat in this area. Um, and now, moment of truth, this is our model's prediction on that area. Um, it locks on quite well. Um, <laughs> um, and in this area in particular, um, we're at 95% accuracy on identifying dams. Um, and 93% on identifying habitat. Um, so this is um, one area we'd say we're doing less well on. Um, it's an area in the Cascades in Washington. So note that our model has never seen anything within probably 100 miles of where this is. Um, so here are the dams again, labeled by Emily um, Habitat. And here's our model predictions. So we're still doing pretty well on the dams themselves, um, but we're picking up a bunch of like river area and uh, other wetlands. Um, and we believe the model just hasn't seen enough negative data of what is not a beaver dam. Um, so it's still just work in progress. But even here, we're at 93% accuracy, which is still pretty high. Um, so we are in the process of sort of validating these results um, potentially for a scientific paper. Um, and one of the first things we did is Emily picked 12 um, patches or areas around uh, the Western US so that we could evaluate it, um, our model. Most of them, the model had never seen before. Um, and uh, even in the worst spot, the accuracies were 86%, um, and the best spot, 99%. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Nick to talk about how we scale this up to uh, like a country level scale. Thank you, Eric. Hello, everybody. Uh, just a couple more details about that model. Um, what goes in is a 120 by 120 patch at 0.2 meters resolution pulled from Google's internal database of imagery. It's the same imagery that you see as the background in maps and Earth, for example. And we have access to all that through Earth Engine. So what we want to do is we want to turn the model loose on this whole corpus of imagery and find beaver habitat wherever we have input imagery. So how does that work? At Google, uh, we have a bunch of tooling to let us sort of scale these, these models to, to very large data sets. And all this is part of the uh, cloud platform. So spef specifically, Earth Engine is the geospatial engine that uh, gives us access to the imagery and lets us make uh, um, uh, uh, extract the digital terrain models that, that Eric described. And, um, but then we also have to have the model. And the model sits on AI Platform, which is another cloud service. And when you want to make predictions, AI Platform asks Earth Engine uh, for the image and makes a prediction, sends the prediction back to Earth Engine, and then you can look at a map. And so that's where the maps came from that uh, Eric was showing. OK, so um, just uh, a little bit more on the mechanics of this. Again, what goes in is this uh, 128 by 128 patch. And what happens is the model will look at one of those patches and say, 
can I see a beaver dam in there or can I see beaver habitat of any kind in there? And, and then it will output one number for the patch, I, uh, uh, specifically the, the probability that the patch contains a beaver habitat. So Earth Engine is reducing the resolution of our input imagery, the background imagery that you see mapped in Earth from 0.2 meters to 25.6 meters. So it's sort of giving us a coarse resolution map from this very high resolution imagery. But in each one of these patches, the model is sort of seeing uh, uh, what's in there. So there are a lot of these 0.2 meter pixels in a county, it turns out. And um, we actually pushed some of the internal systems that I was talking about to their limits in terms of uh, you know, crunching through all this data to find uh, beaver habitat in, in counties of interest. So we've only run a few. Um, what did we run? Um, I think we ran four or five counties at this point. So Summit, Colorado, Carbon, Wyoming, Cache County, Utah, and Tuolumne, California. Um, each county takes about six to 12 hours to process, even with the quota cranked for, you know, the number of predictions that we can get and the number of pixels we can get from Earth Engine and so forth. So it's not a trivial job to, to make a map of, of one of these counties, but we would like to do more. And um, we're very much open to suggestions on, uh, you know, if you've got an area of interest and uh, perhaps you even have some data there and you'd like to see how well the model performs in your area of interest, then um, definitely do let us know and um, we'll, we'll run the model on that county. Um, so what I'm showing here are just a, a couple counties that we did run, and you can't see anything because we're zoomed way out here, um, but it's, it's amazing how um, you can zoom into these places and in fact find beaver habitat where you didn't think any could exist or would exist, for example, in the suburbs. So um, it turns out uh, beavers are everywhere. But we need more training data. So as, as Eric was um, describing, uh, the model doesn't do well everywhere. It does much better where we have training data. And um, we, we think that uh, the more data we get, the more different habitat types and geographic contexts will be represented in our training data set. And that's very important for the model to learn uh, what beaver habitat looks like in all these different contexts. So this is what we need. Um, latitude, longitude, not obfuscated, meaning it's, it, the location has not been randomized in any way. That, that doesn't work for us. Uh, and, and the date, the point was collected because um, the, the imagery is um, uh, temporal as well. And we want to match the, the right imagery to the, the time the point was observed. So if you've got this kind of stuff on the shelf, uh, feel free to send it to us and um, we'll, we'll add it to our training data set. Okay, what's next? Thank you. Um, as I say, we need more training data. Um, we're in process of uh, writing a publication here and sending it for peer review. We'd like to make a user interface around this, uh, you know, uh, analogous to caster mapper, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, we want people to use it. So we, we want the tool to be useful for, for making policy uh, changes and, and management decisions. So um, uh, uh, definitely let us know about that too. Um, we'd like to know if it can be applied to other species, the habitat of which you can see in the imagery. Uh, and of course, we, we considered the unintended consequences of you know publishing a map like this, because then anybody would know where the beavers are and then they could go and disturb them or something along those lines. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, definitely a special thanks to um, the, the folks who uh, contributed data to the project, our advisors, and uh, also the, the folks that have um, inspired us along the way, including Eddie and Dan, who made me a believer too. Thank you very much. If, if you do have data or questions or comments, reach out to us here. We actually have plenty of time for questions this time. I just also want to comment that this is the first time I did hear a gasp in the audience and I heard like a little woot woot. So like, um, you guys, this is, this is pretty exciting stuff. So questions.
So in terms of like integrating this with other big data, uh, essentially, so with national wetlands inventory data, we're trying to also classify wetlands, whether they're beaver or not. And so I could see where it'd be a little bit harder for trappers to find it, but necessarily, but states are trying to map their wetland habitat and whether it's beaver mediated or not. And so how much are you guys integrating into those efforts? We're not tied into that data set, but we are aware of, of projects that are using uh, those data. Uh, we never set out to map wetlands, even though that, um, you know, that, that might be a nice side benefit of, of what's happening here. Uh, but the model is tuned to find very specific habitat elements. And if those elements exist in the wetlands, um, then uh, our model is fairly high accuracy at finding them, but it might not find um, wetland elements uh, that don't have any beaver presence or, or don't have these artifacts that, that they create. I would just add too, there was a very recent blog post by the head of Earth Engine talking about real-time uh, land use um, in Google Maps now. So check that one out. So I kind of have a two-part question. So the first is um, the instances in which the machine doesn't accurately identify a dam, can that be interpreted as a recommendation of where a dam would be under ideal circumstances? And if no, is there a way to like teach it to do that? <laughs> um, I think uh, unscientifically, the answer is yes. Um, the model does find areas that are good riparian habitat, um, but it was never trained to do that. So we haven't evaluated like how well it does on that. Um, I'd say that you could use it for that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not something we've actively trained it for. As for figuring out how to train it for that, um, it's just a question of data. And um, we would probably need to sort of add pre-processing steps, um, like using a tool like Brad or something as input to the model, um, or just having people label what they think is suitable beaver habitat. Um, but one sort of benefit we think um, to this project as a whole is that it doesn't need to only be for beaver dams, right? Like it can really just take in anything as positive input, um, um, as long as we have enough domain specific knowledge. Um, so we are, probably in the long term thinking of expanding it toward other use cases as well, depending on what people find interesting. Um, and so, yeah, I think the reason we, we kept a lot of time for questions is because we really want to know what uh, the community is interested in and what we can like spend our time on. I, I would add too, I certainly would not try that right now. Um, the model really likes cul-de-sacs curving roads and the edges of res reservoirs, which if you think about it actually makes sense because they have a similar form to beaver dams. I, I have a follow-up question. It would seem like this could be a good tool for beaver restoration because we're at least in the upper Midwest where we have any place topography has a slight pinch point and you have, uh, if you use USGS and you speak of the wetlands is that's really uh, a really probably a good place to put a BDA in uh, as a, a starter fluid, so to speak, for, for beavers to recolonate. So I think this could be a really great tool as a restoration tool uh, once you've you know tinkered with it a little few more times. <laughs> Agreed. Thank you all so much. This is so cool to see. Uh, there's been so much work in trying to figure out how many beavers there might be on the landscape. I know you've talked to Emily about this a ton, and this is really my first introduction to what you all have actually achieved here. And I'm really excited because one of the biggest things on our to-do list is changing policy, modernizing beaver management. And the reaction we get to our regulators every time we bring it up is they're not an endangered species, they're not a threatened species, they're not even a species of concern. We don't even know how many there are. And there hasn't been a real population study ever. I mean, everybody quotes an uh, early 1900s paper that then was Nyman, Nyman quoted in the 80s, 15 million beavers maybe, and that's inaccurate, old. And this is going to revolutionize our understanding. So that's really exciting. Thank you, guys. Actually, I'm not sure if I'm going to use the right language to ask this question, but um, in terms of different geographic locations and trying to teach the machine um, the variability, 
will it know okay i'm now i'm in western washington so beaver ponds are really really hard to find and they're little um or now i'm in colorado and they look like this so will it know geographically where you're at um currently no but that is actually a good idea for um basically the only inputs to the model right now are like satellite imagery rgb plus um the slope data um, that being said, um, there's no reason it should only be that. Um, so we're experimenting with different types of inputs. Um, our current plan is to train one large model to do everything, <laughs> um, at least in the Western US where there isn't um, heavy tree cover. Um, the, the idea is that the model should be able to generalize well enough across locations, even though some dams may be smaller or larger. Um, but we do see a possibility if that doesn't work out fully to train like models specific to certain areas, or like you said, add maybe like a, a feature for its location. Um, but I will say we have seen that the model does pretty well outside of areas it hasn't been trained on. Um, and so I think we're, we're pretty um, optimistic that the model will be able to do well across the West. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that too. We've trained it using data from the arid west of, of the US. And if any of you have data sets for the Eastern or Pacific Northwest or areas where the dams actually do look different, even to the human eye, um, please share them with us because that's what we need in order to grow this model outside of just the arid west. Okay. Uh, thank you guys. Um, a couple of, no, I have a, no, you have a, a comment and a question. <laughs> yeah, and uh, taking, a break from my role here. So uh, yeah, I just want to say they're great to work with, just like May and Aaron. And I encourage everyone here to work with them, give them more data. And we're going to really uh, do some cool things with this. Um, one, the question is, as you get more data points and build this out, are there certain types of habitats that you're really looking for to challenge the program with for um, to really make this as robust as you can? Um, I'll say that Emily is probably the best person to answer that question. Um, we've basically asked her that question. Um, but uh, off the top of my head, I'll say like she's mentioned like cattails in Arizona, I think, in Nevada. Um, and yeah, the Cascades, the model doesn't do particularly well on. Um, and also, yeah, heavy tree cover areas that um, look very green and maybe even hard for a human to determine. Um, but I think basically anything that doesn't look like these images um, here um, would be probably a little challenging. Like if the color is different, if the shape and size is um, but honestly, any data is appreciated. I think even if it looks exactly like this, more data is definitely going to help. Yeah, let, um, let me just add a little something to that. Um, as, as Eric said, you know, we require a huge amount of data to learn the 10 million parameters of this model. And uh, the, the more habitat types that we get in there, the better. Uh, but the more training data that we get, uh, we're probably going to want to add more input features to the model. So for example, near infrared data, uh, possibly uh, a backscattering coefficients from Sentinel-1, which is like a, a radar a based estimate of surface roughness. So, you know, what, what kind of trees are they and uh, so forth. And then there are techniques that you can use to maximize your training data, which I think we're using some of already to sort of flip and rotate the, the images so it, it looks different. But what we really need are different habitat types. So little ponds, little dams, little lodges, bank dwelling beavers, all that stuff is great. Are you able to utilize LIDAR imagery or even green LIDAR imagery to capture topography without veg on the landscape in order to capture the structure that might be indicative of beavers in your model? Yeah, so, uh, let's, so there it is. So uh, it's kind of hard to tell uh, from this slide, but um, this is a very high resolution um, digital terrain uh, digital terrain, uh, sorry, digital elevation model, which means that it's not necessarily terrain, there are trees and all kinds of other things in there. 
Uh, some of so so this is from a massive corpus of data like this. Some of it is based on lidar, um, but most of it is is uh, derived uh, photogrammetrically from stereo imagery. So um, we do have all of Jedi, for example, which is a lidar that's mounted on the International Space Station, but it, the points are sparse. There's no like wall to wall lidar coverage that I know of. Um, so yes, we can use it, but it's just not available to us in general. Follow up. Would that help you? You're teaching lab models of either the animals as well as the lidar for our watershed that you then incorporate into the learning of that specific area, or is that just too narrow? Yeah, we can totally do that. Um, the LIDAR has to be gridded already, you know, rasterized in, in some way, but um, yes, that that could be useful. Super cool. Thank you, guys. Um, I was really excited to see, too, that you're training the model on the habitat as well. Uh, beaver often seem to be like the density of colonies seems to be dependent upon available habitat. And so I think if we were going to get to an informed population number, that pairing of dams, but also how much available habitat, that's when we can start getting to density of colonies, right? Like in an arid desert context, you might have one colony a half mile and you're seeing a lot less habitat. Whereas in a well, lots of forage, you'd see that much tighter. Do you want the polygons around the dam points um, for continuing to train that hot habitat model too, or are you just focusing on the, the dams themselves? Yes, we want the polygons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, from all the inputs that I've been given and we passed on are kind of the data point on the dam. And we, we started this using the language of we're searching for beaver dams because that's what I see as a human. We have no idea what the model is actually picking up on. Is it looking at the dams? Is it looking at the habitat? No one really knows, but the more that we train it, the more that we can steer it towards something specific. And the very first time we ran this model, uh, we showed it to Emily and she's like, hmm, you found, you've created a model that identifies green in burn scars. That's the research I'm doing. And it was because it was based on all of her data. So, you know, again, the more data and yeah, if it's polygons of beaver habitat, great. We don't know what it's finding, but we know that it's associating it, you know, to beavers because that's what we're feeding it. Um, have you guys used like a time series of imagery to look at changes in the image? You know, I was thinking even doing that with LIDAR and you could see, you know, those ponds form. Yeah, so that was the original title of this talk <laughs> was um, identifying. Oh, it's still in there. Um, we did not have enough time to to do that yet, but that is that that was sort of like the primary goal of this project originally was to do this over time. Um, I think the reason we haven't done it yet is just because we're still sort of fleshing out the final details of how well it's doing on like a fixed time. Um, once we're confident that it's doing pretty well, then we'll start running it over time series and seeing changes. Um, so yeah, I think Nick talked about scaling up that work we only did in the past few months, um, getting it from sort of like a, s a few square miles to, you know, a full County. And now that we can do that overnight, then yeah, we can do it over time. We just, we have the data for it. We just haven't done it yet. So yeah, we're excited too. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, everybody, let's give them another round of applause.